All right, hi everyone. I am Katherine Blakeman with the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. And today I have the honor of speaking with Dr. John Fobert, who is the national president of One in Four, um, a national nonprofit dedicated to the prevention of sexual assault and rape. And he is also an endowed professor of higher education and student affairs at Oklahoma State University. And just before we start our conversation uh, today about Harvey, the Harvey Weinstein scandal, and what we can do to actually change the culture. I did want to mention that Dr. Fobert is the author of seven books about preventing sexual assault, as well as another book about the harms of pornography, which we'll get into a little bit today. So Dr. Fobert, um, you had mentioned to me at one point that sadly you don't see the Harvey Weinstein scandal as a big surprise. Um, and I think given the cultural context we find ourselves, I would agree with you. So. Could you just go into why you feel that way? Why is this Why is this actually not so surprising? Well, I think it's not surprising that you'd find a man in a position of power abusing that power. And I think really if anyone in a position of power sometimes may abuse it, but sexual assault has become so normative in our society. Um, certainly one in three women overall have experienced it and actually one in six men. Um, so it's not just something that happens to women, but it, it's, it's something that is not only normative in our society, but particularly normative in the narratives that Hollywood tends to play out, whether that's in um, more mainstream movies or through pornography. So I really, I, I really think that a lot of the outrage um, against Harvey Weinstein is certainly deserved, but I think that there's a wider outrage that we need to have over the problem in general and how often it happens to so many people. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is such a high profile case because so many women in Hollywood who have worked with this powerful producer over the years are coming out and talking about it. Um, but you know, everyday pe this is happening to everyday people who, who don't get the same platform um, that, that these individuals um, enjoy in the spotlight, so to speak. Exactly, um, exactly. And so we've seen recently in the past couple of days, the Me Too hashtag campaign, which some celebrities started on Twitter um, it spread to Facebook and all sorts of social media platforms. I think in just a matter of a couple days, over half a million women had either tweeted or, or written on Facebook about Me Too. In other words, they've also been victims of sexual harassment or assault of some kind. So that does give us a really a sobering picture of how prevalent this is. Um, so my question for you as someone who has studied this so much in depth, particularly on college campuses and even within our military, which is a problem that, that we talk about, what do we need to do to change the culture um, and to change you know, people's sexual templates and attitudes and men's attitudes towards women and, and so forth? And, well, one of the reasons why I'm very pleased with the Me Too campaign is that it's more of a grassroots effort that has occurred that helps to shatter some of the silence that's around uh, sexual assault because sexual assault, sexual harassment, they thrive uh, on silence. And for many reasons, silence about who the perpetrator was and holding them accountable in any way and who the survivors are. Because a lot of people think, well, I don't know anybody who's been sexually assaulted or I don't know anyone who's sexually harassed. And I think if any, anyone who's on social media uh, recently can now see they know somebody who's been sexually assaulted. They know someone who's sexually harassed. I mean, I've been involved in the movement to end sexual violence for 25 years and I've, I've heard from um, countless individuals to whom this has happened, but even I learned of some people that I know close to me who um, revealed their status through the Me Too campaign. I had no idea they were ever sexually assaulted. And what that goes to, I think, is developing a deeper sense of empathy within the culture for what people who are sexually assaulted and sexually harassed go to. And one of the things I found in my research is that the more we can get people to empathize with a survivor experience, the less likely they are to commit sexual violence and also the more likely they are to intervene to help prevent it. So that's one of the reasons why I'm enthusiastic towards so many people who have really come out and said, yes, this happened to me too. And it's almost a, like a chorus of voices singing um, so that we might listen to that song and then to you know, repeat this analogy, maybe longer than I should, um, start singing a different tune as a culture. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to say that rape is wrong, sexual harassment is wrong, and it's got to stop. And it's not just one isolated inc incident or one isolated celebrity, it's throughout our culture. 
And it's about time that we all stood up together and said, no more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and one word that you just said that really sticks out to me is empathize. Yes. Um, and, given, and given the excellent research that you've done over the years and, and the firsthand experience you've had researching this um, through your professional realm, um, what, is, what would you say is sort of the primary element um, that can actually decrease empathy in people? And I'll give it away. I think pornography is a big problem uh, mm -hmm. in terms of um, sort of dehumanizing the other, whether it's a male or a female. Well, and certainly... So, Certainly, pornography um, gets people to think that there's a certain way that's socially acceptable to treat others. And the view of women that is shown in pornography is one that is um, very canned um, and very violent. I mean, we know from research that women are grossly violated in pornography, whether it's porn films or, um, or in video clips or just still images. Um, I mean, when, when you have behaviors that are normative, and I don't want to go into too graphic detail in this forum, but normative where um, you have bodily fluids uh, that are expelled on women or um, where they're beaten and tortured and gagged and uh, have so many different things done to them, that, that becomes more socially acceptable the more people watch that. And I worry most about your 11, 12, 13 year old kids who are seeing this and thinking, oh, this is what sex is. So if I ever get to the point where I do that, this is what I'm supposed to do. And that I think um, really trains us, uh, trains people to think that kind of violence is okay. And it's an empathy killer. I mean, we're not going to empathize with someone experiencing violence if what we're ingesting through the media is constantly violent images that make it okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It, yeah, it really kills that sen sense of empathy um, in people. And, and as you said, um, it's affecting children at younger and younger ages. I've, I've mm -hmm. heard you in, in previous interviews and talks talk about, um, you know, children as young as 13 and younger, and it's just they're increasingly having access to smartphones and just these images are just a click away for them and you know Absolutely. we can't know i don't know harvey weinstein's personal life but if we just look at how prevalent pornography use is across the culture um it wouldn't be surprising should anybody who commits sexual assault be be using um or addicted to pornography. Well, absolutely. I mean, sexual assault and pornography tend to go hand in hand. And so they're not everybody who uses pornography is going to commit sexual assault, obviously. Um, but it does make it more likely. And, and I don't know much about Harvey Weinstein. And to be perfectly honest, I hadn't even heard his name until a few days ago. So um, that shows you, I guess, maybe how little I know about what's going on in, in some areas of Hollywood. But um, I, I think it would be helpful if as a culture, we stop talking so much about the isolated incidents of people who have many victims like Mr. Weinstein. And I think we do need to talk about that, but I think we need to talk about the broader cultural problem and that it isn't just Harvey Weinstein. It isn't just Bill Cosby. It isn't just any number of these other people that we know the names of, but it's people we know and it's people we love who are experiencing this uh, and it's time we worked as a culture to to combat that. And it can be very little things like when someone makes a joke out of a rape situation or uses the word rape out of context. So I think it's, you know, we should be a little taken aback by that and say, hey, why do you have to use the word rape to talk about your math test? That math test didn't rape you. Um, or, or when, you know, I've seen in some mainstream movies how they've made fun of people who experience rape. And that's just ridiculously deplorable. So those are some little things we can do. I also think that we can um, stand up in the moment and step in if we see a sexual assault that might be happening. And particularly among the, you know, the 18 to 30 year old age group where they may be at a party and they, they see that someone is not so able to take care of themselves anymore and someone's taking advantage of them, it's time to stand up, step in and say, no, this isn't going to be happening right now. I'm going to help take care of her, but not in the way that you had planned on. That, those are all excellent tips and, and things that I wish more people could hear. I think um, the, the, the value that you're adding to the discussion, I have seen articles written about the harms that mention the harms of pornography, but I haven't seen in sort of across the mainstream networks or in some of the major uh, papers enough discussion, I think, about how to get to the root of the problem, which I think is really what you're addressing in your work, which is so important. Um, so one other question I had, and um, I think it's a interesting one for me as a woman, but what can women do? I think 
in, in some sense, sometimes women can feel like, you know, we just have to kind of wait for certain men who are, you know, who engage in these predatory behaviors to just change their behavior. And we're, we're sort of victims in this culture, um, sort of passive bystanders, but I certainly don't think that's the case. We are, women are powerful, uh, uh, agents of cultural change mm -hmm. so what do, what's your thought on women specifically is there something specific that women can do i think like you said the grassroots campaign where women are are feeling emboldened to speak out is very important mm -hmm. but are there any other things any other counsel that you would give to women well i would give uh women counsel that if they experience sexual harassment in the workplace or if they experience sexual assault to report it to whatever authority seems most appropriate and it can be someone within their workplace that they might report it to it can be the police it could be at their college or university but i think reporting of anyone um, who experiences sexual assault, I think for men or for women, um, it, it's important to report. But more, um, more broadly, I think you know, when I talked earlier a little bit about how we need to stand up, step in, and help prevent sexual assault and, and sexual harassment from happening, that's something that both men and women can do together. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't just need to be men coming on their shining white horse and coming to the rescue. I think um, there's strength in numbers, and and I think it's important for all of us to look out for each other. So, you know, if there if there are women who are going out to a party together and they notice that you know one of their friends is is being uh, inappropriately uh, hit on by someone when she's really not ready to make a decision about whether or not she wants to be with that individual at all. Other women need to come in and say, hey, got a phone call, you have to take it now and usher her away or whatever creative ways yeah. of, of getting someone's attention. But we, we can't sit back and s simply say, well, it's not my problem anymore. And I think if anything, the recent events that have occurred in the media help us realize this is a big problem. It's society wide. And the real outrage, I think, needs to be not against one individual, but against our culture. And we need to begin to address that. We need to begin to address how much pornography is being ingested, how often it is that women are put down, the sexism in our culture, um, and, and how women are just um, repeatedly harassed and raped. And no one is, well, I, I want to say we aren't as outraged as we should be about that. And we need more outrage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think um, just in conclusion, really, you've sort of answered this question in, in many regards throughout the interview. But it, but I think some individuals in our culture sort of view pornography as maybe a First Amendment issue, or it's sort of untouchable, or it's sort of, it's so ubiquitous that why would you try to fight against that? You know, it's it will be impossible to eradicate. So sort of what, what words of hope and inspiration would you give to people as to what needs to be done or sort of what course of action we need, do we need to take to change the mentality that some people have that this is just an inevitable, you know, untouchable part of our culture? Yeah, I think that there are lots of things that we can do. I mean, I, I think the first thing is don't use pornography. I mean, we can make an individual decision not to. And often, you know, when people talk about the word pornography or whichever, people sort of laugh it off and say it's no big deal. Well, I think we need to stop having that attitude. And when we hear, you know, a friend our age and it's like, oh, yeah, I just I, I looked at porn last night. Isn't that funny? I think we can say, no, it's not funny because I really don't like the way that women are treated in porn and the way that women are treated and dehumanized. And when, when someone is dehumanized, it makes violence against them so much more possible. So I think that's some of what we can do. The other thing is that the, the internet um, getting into households is transmitted through, oh, I don't know, about 30 or 40 different uh, internet service providers. I think we need to start holding internet service providers accountable for distributing an obscene material. And so that's one specific thing I think that we can encourage lawmakers to start to hold people responsible. And I think it's time for the Justice Department to, to start prosecuting illegal online pornography. And there's a lot of it out there. Um, and I think we can have many efforts if we just start fighting harder and not just say, oh, it's no big deal. Because um, it's affecting people's uh, intimate relationships, it's affecting how we view each other, and it's just a part of the toxicity of our culture today that I really think we need to flush out, mm -hmm. flush down the, the, the cultural toilet and not have that to be part of what we consume anymore, and mm -hmm. that we might uh, treat each other just a little bit better. Mm, absolutely. All excellent points. 
Um, and I think that there, there is reason for hope. I've seen some commentary that says, well, there are going to be more Harvey Weinsteins. It's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and we don't live in a perfect world, um, but there's a lot that we can do to change the culture. It's been done on many other social causes, many other fronts. Absolutely. So there's a lot of hope still. So where can people learn more about your research, read some of your research online? Oh, thank you. Um, I have all of my research on my website. Um, if you can spell my name, you can find my website. It's johnfobert.com. So J-O-H-N-F-O-U-B-E-R-T.com. And I have an area of the website where I put all of my peer-reviewed publications and also other um, different editorials I've written for either CNN or the New York Times or the Huffington Post. And so people can access those. And, um, and I hope they'll learn a little bit more about what I might have to say and offer because uh, I, I think like many people, I'm looking to make this world a better place and I think we can do that together. Thank you so much, Dr. Fobert. We appreciate you joining us today. Absolutely, thank you.